Hello and welcome again to Rewind, where we are celebrating 10 years of Al Jazeera English by looking back at some of the best documentaries of the past decade. Today, we rewind to 2013, when after the earthquake of 2010, a cholera epidemic hit Haiti and killed thousands. The outbreak was the worst in recent history. And as Al Jazeera's Fault Lines team found out, the source of the outbreak was surprising to many, including, it seemed, to those initially responsible. Later, we'll find out if there is hope for Haiti to eradicate cholera once and for all, as it has been for the world's wealthiest countries. But first, let's watch Haiti in the time of cholera. Haiti, October 2010, at a hospital in a small rural town north of the capital. These were the first victims of a horrific unknown disease in a country still reeling from a devastating earthquake. Patients were dying in the space of a few hours. Children were especially vulnerable. Al Jazeera was the first news channel on the scene. In the following days and weeks, we tracked the epidemic as it ripped across the country, leaving dozens, then hundreds, and soon thousands of Haitians dead in its wake. I'd reported from war zones for years and from Haiti since the day after the earthquake. They've received 43 bodies. But this was a new disaster that shocked the world. Cholera had somehow arrived in Haiti. And it wasn't long before rumors that UN Nepalese peacekeepers were involved led us to a base on the banks of the country's largest river. What are you digging? Why are you digging here? Well, we're not being told exactly what's going on here, but it certainly smells like sewage. There are toilets right there, and the liquid seems to be draining into this river just a few meters away that flows into the nearby town of Mirbalé. Back then, it felt like we'd stumbled on the scene of a crime. Now, after a series of investigations, including by the UN itself, it seems that's exactly what did happen. In the more than two years since we first visited this site, almost everything that we suspected from the scenes that we found now appears to be true. Scientists have said that the cholera found in that river is almost identical to a strain of the disease found in Nepal before those soldiers were deployed. Even Bill Clinton, the UN special envoy to Haiti, has said that UN peacekeepers from that base are the likely source of the disease in Haiti. But the one thing that hasn't happened is that the UN hasn't accepted any kind of liability for bringing the epidemic to this country. In fact, at this point, they still won't even talk about it. It's been more than two years since cholera appeared in Haiti. And we're driving into one of the most isolated areas of the country. Communities up here in the mountains surrounding the Artibonite River are almost completely cut off from basic services. Up here, catching any kind of disease is a serious matter. It is impossible, really, to imagine how somebody could get along paths like this to medical facilities within a few hours to save lives from cholera. This is the kind of scenario here. And the reality is that many of them don't, and we're on our way now to a funeral at the very top of this mountain for a man who didn't make it. When he died from cholera, Barrio Sujen was 64 years old. He was a leader of the community in this tiny mountaintop village and a father of three. Farius fell ill just days ago. From his house, it's about five hours' walk to the nearest clinic. As a UN helicopter flies over the funeral, we're told that nobody here has any idea how the outbreak started. In villages like this across the country, this is a scene that's been repeated thousands of times. Farius is the latest victim of a disease unknown in Haiti two years ago, but that's now a leading cause of death in the country. Farisa's death from cholera won't actually be counted in any official statistics. There are no Ministry of Health personnel who know about this or NGOs. This is just one example of how the death toll from this epidemic could be much higher than anyone knows. 
Cholera victims have gathered for a monthly meeting to discuss ways of dealing with the epidemic in their midst. Everyone at this meeting has either been infected with the disease or had a family member die. So how many people here actually know somebody that's died of cholera? As the meeting adjourns, we're told of an urgent new case. An elderly woman living close by who's in a critical condition. Saint-Ilia Hilaire is losing strength fast. But her relatives are worried the journey down the mountain might kill her. The sun is very bright at this time of day, so they were going to wait until later. But we've offered to give them a lift and drive them all the way down the mountain to the nearest cholera treatment center. They decide to make a break for it, taking it in turns to carry her over the rice fields, along mud paths, to where the road begins. This is Haiti in the time of cholera. Communities living in fear. Each day, a new race for survival. Santilia did reach the clinic before losing her strength, but in the end, it wasn't enough. A few weeks later, she succumbed to cholera, her body taken back home and buried in the mountains. While the death toll from cholera continues to rise, a new fight for justice has begun. Mario Joseph is the most famous lawyer in Haiti. He's won landmark victories for victims of political persecution. Today, he's collecting medical records. With very limited resources, Mario is representing thousands of Haitians who've been affected by cholera. It's the case of his life. They're trying to sue the United Nations. United Nations have a lot of money we don't have. And they have a lot of 100,000 lawyers. We have only 12. The lawsuit, filed in November 2011, claims that UN failures to screen its soldiers for cholera and follow international rules on waste disposal constitute gross negligence. What are they doing? Are they gathering here? Yeah, they're gathering here. It's based on the UN's own investigation, which concluded that the Nepalese base leaking sewage into the river was a likely source of the outbreak. <laughs> And it's composed of thousands of stories of personal loss, each one documented by Mario and his team. The next meeting is in Mirbalé. The town that's home to the UN base where the disease is known to have started. Henrietta Paul's husband, was one of the very first to die. She doesn't know exactly where he's buried. Back then, the death toll was so high that bodies were being dumped in mass graves. Today, she and her daughter Lisette are filing a new claim. The family's only son, Fritz Nell, died three weeks ago from cholera. He was 34. Back at their headquarters in downtown Port-au-Prince, the fruits of the lawyer's painstaking labor is kept in a dusty storeroom, still waiting for the day it will be used in court. These are all the case files in here? Yes, we got all cases. The first 5,000 file. Not only we fill the, 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 the form, we notarize. They said we received the complaints. We will give you an answer on a response on due, on due time. Yeah, I don't know when the reasonable time will be. 
But it's been more than a year. More, more than a year. And you've heard nothing? Nothing, nothing. Faced with the UN's silence, the lawyers decided to expand the lawsuit, adding more names to the thousands who'd already filed a complaint. UN have to respond. UN must respond. But they promote human rights. And we will continue to fight. Until they don't respond, we will file complaints for all people. The 2010 earthquake killed more than 220,000 people. Those who lost their lives are remembered each year, with dignitaries from around the world coming to pay their respects. But for those who've died and continue to die from the cholera epidemic, there is no day of mourning. And even senior UN officials are staying silent on whether the victims' families deserve any compensation for their loss. You've said the UN introduced I, cholera I think, to Haiti. Do you, do you think they should I be liable for all of those deaths? There's nearly well, 8,000 people that I have been think, killed. Uh, that's a decision someone else has to make now. I think the mo most important thing is that the UN asked Paul Farmer to oversee the response. We've got the, the uh, infection and, and mortality rate cut in half. And I think it can be contained, so I'm encouraged by that. There's 8,000 people already Thank dead, you. Mr. President. One can tell to the Haitian population. Who's, 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 who should answer for those people that Thank are already you. dead, Mr. President? Thank you. Mr. Thank President? You. Thank you. Well, the ceremony is over and the cavalcade's now leaving, and we still haven't got any answers. Bill Clinton there saying it's not for him to decide whether or not the UN's liable, but he's actually said that the UN brought the disease to this island. So if he can't answer the question about accountability, it's not really clear who can. Our next stop, UN headquarters in Haiti. Here, at least we'd be able to find out why Mario's clients had been waiting over a year for a response to their lawsuit. We've been promised an interview with Nigel Fisher, the head of the UN mission in Haiti that's known by its acronym MINUSTAR. Oh, hi, is that Nigel Fisher's office? It doesn't look like it's going to happen. But it okay. was proving difficult um, well, to get well, hold of him. I guess we'll just do what we can to try to catch up with him. Just as we were about to give up. This is Nigel Fisher. This is the man we've been trying to find all afternoon. It seems he's finally turned up. So we'll see if he's actually going to answer our questions. Do you remember me, Sebastian from Al Jazeera? You're very nice yeah. to see you again. You? <laughs> very well, yeah, thank you. Sorry to keep. Uh, That's all right. We're it's trying just to just get some of your time. Day. Yeah. Um, um, how long do you need? I mean, we we need, really needed as much time as possible, but it's been pretty okay. difficult to try to um, get that. But um, can we ask you some questions now? Sure, sure. Okay. Let me dump this stuff. Well, the one thing that we found difficult to talk to about um, with senior officials here is the question of liability. Nobody seems to be able to talk about that even? What, what, what well, is it's the position? It's true. We, we cannot. Um, Why? As, as, as a, an official here in Haiti and a civil servant, um, right now I cannot speak about it. Who can we get answers from? Well, I, I think it has to be at, at UN headquarters. Um, in New is, York? It is. I don't know whether you'll get an answer at this, process, at this point, but the people who are reviewing this are at headquarters. They're in the legal department. They're working with the Secretary General's office on this. We followed Nigel's advice. It seemed like the only way of getting any answers for the families in Haiti was to head to where all those decisions are seemingly taken. New York. But before we even arrived at UN headquarters, we got word from Mario's legal partners in the US that a decision had already been made. They sent me an email the, uh, shortly before they made the public announcement. They sent us an email with the letter. What did it say? Uh, the letter was uh, one paragraph about how the UN was sorry about the cholera and the harm that it caused. Several paragraphs about all the things they are doing to combat cholera. And then a paragraph at the end saying that they were not going to respond justly to the cholera victims. Human rights lawyer Brian Concanon says he'd been expecting the UN would try to avoid paying compensation, but that the lack of any explanation caught him completely off guard. It was also a slap in the face to the, to the 660,000 Haitians who have contracted cholera and the 8,000 who have died so far, or at least their families. 
the UN announced its decision to the world in a brief five-minute statement. There was no official press conference, and since then, as in Haiti, there had been no further comment to the media. Now, I've asked several officials who can actually talk to us inside this building, and the one person we've been told we can interview is a spokesperson for the Secretary General. Claims found to be outside the scope of the Section 29 of the Convention are not receivable. The consequence of a finding that a claim is not receivable is that the claim will not receive further consideration by the organization. That, that statement was very brief. It was it's, a, it's, it's a brief statement, it's a legal statement, and that's about all we're going to say on that. But why is the claim not receivable? Well, it's not the United Nations practice to discuss in public the details of our responses to claims against the organization. So you don't have to explain yourselves? No. You're saying that not only do they not get compensation, but you don't even have to explain why? Well, that's exactly what I've said. That's the United Nations policy. What would you say to a family member in Haiti who has had somebody die um, as a result of this disease? Well, I would, basically, I would basically say as a UN employee or as a human being? As right. both. I would simply say, I'm really sorry about your loss. I'm really sorry that the, the cholera happened. We don't exactly know what the origins are, but we're working as hard as we can to but address everybody the Everybody knows what the origins were. The well, scientific community is our, united. Our, our panel told us that it was due to a confluence of circumstances. Including and being brought to Haiti, that most is, likely by UN well, peacekeepers. From that's Nepal. not what it said. Wait a minute. So the UN still maintains that Nepalese soldiers weren't the most likely source of cholera in Haiti? We asked one of their own scientists. They found a range of evidence pointing towards the UN peacekeepers, including that the type of cholera was very similar to a recent outbreak in Nepal. Since the time of our report, our conclusions have been significantly strengthened. The Nepal strain of cholera was fully sequenced and compared to the Haitian strain. And when they did that direct comparison, it was found that of the four million base pairs in cholera, there was only one base pair that was different between the two strains. And in genetics, we consider that an exact match. As far as we know, the claims that they are giving us is not, are non-receivable, and that's under international law. Stonewalled by this official, we decided there must be someone at UN headquarters who could explain the organization's decision. We, we, we spoke to the, the press of us. Before security could shut us down. Eventually, we found a more senior spokesperson. The, I mean, is there anyone else who, who can... Because seriously, he was, he was literally reading from a piece of paper. It seems a little odd to me that you're interviewing me about the interview you've had with my deputy. Well, we're trying to get answers, and he wasn't able to well, give any. He, he, he just said it's something that I don't have answers to. Well, uh, why do you think that it would be any different with me? Is there anyone who would have those answers? Uh, uh, Sebastian, you've asked me that question three times now, and uh, I think you know what the answer is. And I think it would be actually be quite polite if you would switch this off now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and d don't you think? Don't you think that's... Okay. okay. At every turn, the story from UN officials was the same. Outright refusal to accept any responsibility, yet a complete inability to explain why. It was the same from Haiti to New York, from those on the ground to those at the very top. Mr. Secretary General, what explanation is there for the fact that there's no compensation being paid to the families of the, of, of the victims? Well, I think I have made it quite clear the reason why and this case is not receivable. And was it your decision ultimately? Whose decision was it in the end? Oh yes, it was my decision, but based on all uh, a careful consideration. Do you think it's the right decision? Yeah, I think so, yeah. But, but for the families of the victims? Uh, well, why, don't you, why don't you talk to uh, my legal counsel? So you were saying there's no possibility at all of speaking with anyone from legal counsel? No. Following the Secretary General's advice, I did put several calls in, but was told that the UN's legal counsel was unavailable for comment. So we've spotted the Secretary General again in this room. We're going to try and catch him when he comes out. Access to the office. Time, sir, thank you. So you said we could get office to the... It's enough, it's enough. Yeah. It's enough, it's enough. We haven't given any access to the Office of Legal Counsel. Thank you, it's all thank you. 
where we've just been told that the media office has said that they don't actually want us back in the building at all because of displeasure at the fact that we've been asking questions to officials in the hallways. They've said that we're effectively banned from filming in the United Nations complex. On an intellectual level, the UN's rejection of our claims was, was expected. But on an emotional level, the UN's rejection was still very hard to take because you're left thinking about, about people in, in Bocazel who lost their, their child, uh, the, the family in Sodo who lost the father and mother and, and are condemned to generational poverty. And you think that th their, their chances of getting justice have been reduced. Parce que, il y a longtemps qu'on a souffert là. Réfléchis ou bien, en 2010, il y a un choléra, il 2013 là. Les Haïtiens ont mouru, les Haïtiens ont dit arrêt, ici, c'est ici, c'est l'autre bord. In Haiti, along with their sadness, the costs of burying their dead have left the family who we met with Mario and his lawyers severely in debt. Their son's grave is in a cemetery close to their house, but the death of the last male in the family has left them with no reliable income. They've just had to pull his 11-year-old daughter out of school. Et puis là, voulez pour aller l'école. Nous-même nous pas gain cob l'école là pour nous payer l'école là et puis pour direction l'école pas recevoir pour nous sans cob. Côté l'école là. Ouais, ça fait nous mal. Ça fait nous mal en pile. The UN's decision hadn't even been made when we first met this family. But it seemed they had a sense of what was coming. Et minister lui-même, même l'elle te connait, elle te fait, l'a toujours, l'a toujours plaidé dit non, pas de fait. Parce qu'elle ouais peuple là, lui-même, son peuple, un petit peuple grand goulier, il gait en connait man, reste manger minister bien, l'a joindre pour manger, c'est tout normal, il ca pas pas révolter contre lui. Apart from anger over compensation, what may be more worrying to officials back in New York is the lasting damage in Haiti to the reputation of an organization that's supposed to stand for justice and equality around the world. C'est pas un bagage qui jambe pour haïtien, jambe camper pour dire au premier ministre. Même l'aide de dommage, il pas jambe haïtien pas jambe finir mais honnête non. Il doit pas ramener moi même si faut mourir dans choléra. C'est tout normal, moi-même, je suis en train de me faire parler de ministre. Parce que ça a fait mal. En 2016, Ban Ki-moon, le même UN secretary general, questionné dans notre rapport, a finalement reconnu que la UN a joué un rôle dans le premier outbreak et a appelé à un nouveau set d'actions en Haïti. Mais est-ce que ça sera Speaking with us is a human rights lawyer to update us there on the situation. To date, the UN's eradication efforts have been wholly inadequate. Um, we have seen cholera rates been brought down after the immediate surge of cases, but, but they've since gone back up again. And in 2016, we've seen cholera cases um, at a higher rate than we saw in 2014 and 2015. And that was even before Hurricane Matthew struck. And now in southern Haiti, cholera is, is an enormous emergency. Um, the UN did launch in 2012 a plan to eliminate cholera from Haiti together with the Haitian government. Um, but that plan has only been funded at 18% as of, as of earlier this year. And so for several years it's been stagnant, there hasn't been enough money to even treat the incoming patients that, that were trying to seek care in cholera treatment centers. We saw treatment centers being shut down. And so the need for robust funding is, continues to be enormous and, and incredibly grave. Um, what we have seen, though, is that now there's been the launch of a new plan um, that focuses more, more directly on getting cholera under control. And I think we're hopeful that over the next two years, if this plan is immediately funded, that we can see a, a long overdue drop in the death rate in Haiti. Communities are also asking for compensation for people who have died, for people who have suffered. Um, we have 
clients, um, including Lisette Paul, who's who's featured in Haiti in the time of cholera. That family continues to struggle to date. Compensation is important to help people get back on their feet. And so Lisette's family and, and her story can be told thousands of times over again in Haiti. And they continue to feel the very direct impacts of cholera on their daily life today. Well, that's it for this week. Please join us at the Rewind website, where you can also leave your comments about this or any other program in the series. Until the next Rewind, goodbye.